Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Just to check, I was asked to make sure the volume of the sound is all right. Everyone can hear all right. I hope so. I, like all speakers, I'm completely guilty of uh, putting far too many slides in and trying to get too much in. So probably I'm going to speak very quickly. And I have to. It is actually a very large, a very complex topic, and I want to just glide over a lot of it uh, today. And it's, in many ways, it's not really the history of gunpowder, although I will to include that, because actually. I don't believe yet a history of gunpowder could actually be written. This is actually a summary of some of the work we've done uh, for the last 20 years. We started about just about 2000. Um, and I just want to go through some of the work and show you what we've done and tried to do. Some of the work's old, some it's new. Um, it's a mixture, and I hope you enjoy it. So what is gunpowder? And I put this up to remind me to say that the other word we always use for gunpowder is black powder. They're the same. It's just gunpowder is black, and often people get confused. But I've had people confuse me and say, what is black powder? Just gunpowder. What actually is it made of? It's a very, very simple mixture. Saltpeter, I just call it saltpeter. Officially, it's potassium nitrate. We'll come on to that. Charcoal, you know what charcoal is. And the element sulfur, the yellow element sulfur. And actually, it's one of those materials that is actually, in one respect, an incredibly simple mixture of those. You just mix them together dry, it'll work. But actually, what it does, how it behaves, and its properties are very, very far from simple. And that's one of the things our work has brought out. Just, I want to spend a few minutes just telling you about the, some of the history of the gunpowder. It's clear the most important part of gunpowder is the saltpeter. Charcoal, of course, and sulfur have been known since antiquity, forever, really. Uh, but it's the saltpeter that's the crucial thing. And this seems to have been discovered in China. The story always goes that the emperor was paying people to alchemists to find the elixir of life. Uh, and people were trying to formulate all sorts of compounds. And one of them was a white crystal sub crystalline substance, which they found preserved meat. And saltpeter is still used and was used extensively. It's still used in sausages and preserving meat. It's a great preserve. So the idea was, A, you could preserve meat, so you could preserve the emperor's life. And it's ironic, of course, to think that uh, uh, the other way around it's killed rather a lot of people. But anyway, around the 6th, 7th, 8th century, it is confusing. I, I, I don't never like to say exactly where, but they certainly found saltpeter, and the Chinese for two or three centuries were making some sort of incendiary mixture. This wonderful, wonderful banner, that's uh, from Danang in China, um, is now in Paris. It's dated around 1000, and it's showing two devils. They're obviously some sorts of gunpowder devices. Uh, whether they're guns or not, but some sort of incendiary gunpowder devices. Uh, and that's the, one of the earliest representation, really. So around 1000, well before Hastings. And for the next two or three centuries, the Chinese were definitely using uh, gunpowder mixtures in incendiaries. And there's the famous and very magisterial works by Joseph Needham on the history and technology of China published oh, forever and ever through the 20th century it seems, he wrote a wonderful book called The Epic of Gunpowder um, and he goes through the development of this and proves a lot and he really laid the foundations for a lot of what I want to say, although actually he's, one of his very crucial findings and uh, parts of the book I now think is wrong. But this for instance is a Chinese, what Needham called an eruptor because he didn't think that the Chinese invented the gun. Uh, 12th, 13th century, the dating is always tricky. But the very famous illustration, if you've got any book, any work on artillery at all, this is the first uh, representation of cannon of artillery in Europe. It moves from China to the west, of course, probably via the Silk Road, the Silk Routes, uh, bringing, I used to think it brought the idea, now I'm more convinced actually, that probably uh, it brought the, the first saltpeter as well. Well, in fact, that was why. But this is dated 1326. This copy is in Oxford. There's actually a second copy of the same book dated 1326 as well in the British Library. Uh, but this is the famous, but I, I never know how to say it, mile meat or millimeat, mile meat manuscript. Uh, and you can see this wonderfully vase-shaped gun. People often ask me, why an arrow? It seems very bizarre. But it always seems quite obvious to me, that's what you shot. You shot bows and arrows, you shot crossbows. Arrows were the thing, to, a projectile. So actually it's quite a, an obvious thing. And of course the arrow extends back beyond the fletching, beyond the flight, into the barrel itself, down to the bottom. Um, so it's not as if it's just 
perched in the end, uh, whatever. and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit a bit later. But strangely, actually, gunpowder weapons through the 14th century, from 1326 to the end of the century, it, I, I mean, I, there are none. There are none. I, you, I, I defy anybody to show me one or find one. Our knowledge then is very, very, very limited. And it goes actually into the first half of the 15th century. And this, which I hope you'll recognise is Mons Mega Edinburgh Castle, is the first gun we actually have a date for. This is 1453. It's not quite true, perhaps. I'll, I'll skate over that. Um, and she's dated from documentary evidence. So this is over a century uh, after um, artillery and gunpowder first make it into Europe. Uh, in fact... <coughs> But actually, it still takes a long time before gunpowder really makes a real effect. And it's a, a touch word for my idea, uh, the way I often say it, is warfare is never won by technology. And certainly gunpowder uh, gun weapons didn't really win wars. Although this battle, the bat Battle of Pavia, 1525, is always said to be the first major battle at which gunpowder weapons, both artillery and handguns, really made a difference. But again, you're... You're, you're close on two centuries after it going. And it's quite interesting, by 1620, uh, Francis Bacon is calling it one of the, the three great inventions with printing um, and the nautical compass. But that is, is that three centuries or something later. And of course, during the 17th century, gunpowder really comes into its own. It becomes a very, very major part of armies. Uh, so all sorts of things go on. I just put this slide in. Uh, it's a late 17th century ship. This is how Western Europe dominated the world. It dominated trade routes and whatever, using ships like this, armed to the gunnels uh, with cannon, um, very powerful floating uh, fortresses, if you like. Now, a lot of the work that I've been trying to do, uh, and I'm going to come to, has been come through experimental work. And I put a couple of slides in because um, it, it tries to show you just what the problems we encountered were. This is the formula that people often put up as how gunpowder explodes. It's, when I show this to real chemists, they all say it's meaningless. It doesn't really go like that. It's much, much, much more complex. But the thing that I wanted to do was to say, out of that formula and out of a lot of work and a lot of experimental work, the ideal formula for gunpowder, good gunpowder, is this. And I w it's just in people at work in this called it 75, 15, 10. So 75 saltpeter, 15 charcoal, 10 sulfur. And that is supposed to be the best. Now the theory goes, the theory that Needham put forward and, uh, and people have followed for a long time is that gunpowder with lower amounts of saltpeter will not explode. They won't work. And certainly people talk about when you get down to around 50%, all it does is burn. It doesn't explode, it doesn't burn, it doesn't do anything, it's useless. And this is where Needham built up a huge uh, idea of how China developed gunpowder and the development, because he didn't think they developed the gun because they didn't have enough saltpeter. I, he also thought, and I'll come back to it, that they invented rockets first. But as you'll, I'll show you towards the end of the talk, rockets are rocket science and they ain't simple. So, what do we want to know about gunpowder? The, the point about gunpowder, we start our research. What is clear is medieval gunpowder is not like today's gunpowder. Today's gunpowder is made in very heavily mechanised mills. It's very highly compressed, made into cakes, very hard cakes. It's polished and got graphite on it. It's a very standard product. It is not like medieval gunpowder. Unfortunately, we don't have any. It's a dangerous substance. People didn't want it lying around, it's thrown away. It also doesn't keep very well. Um, it keeps better than a lot of people think, I think, but um, it doesn't keep, and after 22 or three decades, it will deteriorate and, and go off and doesn't work. But we ain't got none. And every so often, someone in the press or the news says, oh, we found some, and then you find out that actually it's 19th century, or actually it's just, as we did, S several years ago when we got very excited about a big find in India found out actually all it was was wonderful cakes of sulphur uh, not gunpowder at all the other interesting part of gunpowder is when you go back so you do your search through the literature and you're looking at it and you find the, the wonderful Benjamin Robbins who you've never read anything about in the late 18th century 
uh, got very interested in gunpowder, wrote wonderful early works on how gunpowder happens and how you can research it. He got going. The problem is, gunpowder is not a very good explosive. Okay, it goes bang, it only has limited power, and it produces vast amounts of smoke. You'll see some slides of that later. Actually, it's not really By the 1840s, they were desperate to find new explosives and nitro, uh, gun cotton, nitrocellulose, TNT comes along, and gunpowder. Oh, rubbish, don't want that anymore. So that research essentially stops. And for about the last century and a half, there's only been maybe a dozen papers about gunpowder published in the academic world, uh, on, on you know, real scientific papers. And the last thing that sort of complicates things a bit is we don't know anything about the very early types of gunpowder weapons, the guns that they were in, alike. They don't survive. Or rather, they probably do survive, we can't date them yet. So this whole work started by a very, very fortuitous meeting between myself and a, a colleague in, in Denmark, Peter Deming, who you'll see a picture of later. Uh, and we decided we'd work on... Uh, um, the effects and experiments on gunpowder. And when we got together, we were looking it back, and, and we sort of started, not so much working together, but other people had started to look at the same problems. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of the very early experimental work. This is the gun I showed you earlier, the 1326. Well, the Royal Armoury was actually able to make a copy, a speculative copy, which we actually did some very simple tests on. Lots of complications due to finances, economics, and transport, and all sorts of things. Meant we only did some very, very, very limited tests on. And the amazing thing about this was, everybody wanted to stuff it full of gunpowder, which is what we started off. And every time we fired it, it just blew the arrow to smithereens. It actually works with a tiny, tiny, an ounce or two of powder, just 25 grams or something. And it was only really late in the day we discovered it worked. It does work. And you, I, you probably can't see it, but the arrow is sitting there, and the, it, the fletching goes on beyond the fletching, so it sits right inside the barrel. But the really exciting work started in the uh, early part of this century, where the Royal Armouries and the Mary Rose Trust got together and started making replica guns from the Mary Rose, sank in 1545. Um, we were able to make these guns and test them. This is one of the wrought iron guns from the main deck of the Royal Mary Rose, so this is a front line gun firing stone shot. This is a full size, full replica shot at a small range and you can see the amount of powder of, of uh, smoke it makes. And we set up a rudimentary ship side to fire at because actually it was with the Mary Rose, we were very interested in, in the defeat of ships and what was going on. So we were firing this as oak planking, not really quite as thick as the Mary Rose would have been but we, it again it, um, it was, it's starting to give us some ideas. And what's interesting is this was a stone ball where it goes in. Uh, um, it's actually quite a small hole. It's that little punch, little hole through it or whatever. But stunningly at the back, look what happens. The wood just goes, shatters and sends a shower of splinters and stuff behind it. So if you're standing there, the crew, everybody, you're either injured, put out of action, or actually, if you're standing right behind it, this, that would have killed you. The ball probably didn't do anything to you. And this has actually informed other work. There's been some very, very recent work with the vast cell in Stockholm, and they learned from this early work, and they did a lot of work on uh, now looking at the splintering effects. We were also able to go on to make a full-size bronze cast replica from the Mary Rose. Uh, this is one of that. This is the, f the full thing, uh, firing cast iron shot now, Huge range down in Essex at Shoebury Ness, which I think is closed now, but anyway, you can see the smoke. It had a range of over a kilometre. Um, ranges are a very difficult subject, and it's not a, whatever it is, get on to, I don't want to get onto it, but it worked extremely well. But the real problem with all this work, it looks fabulous, it gives you some data, it's all done using modern gunpowder. So you buy it from ICI or whoever, and you put it in your gun, you don't know how much to make how much to put in, because you can't put the same amount of medieval gunpowder. So actually, the, although the experiments are very informative, they don't give you anything. And I forgot to say, this is a, one of the high-speed photographs that you can see. I don't know if you can see the cannon on the right. A wonderful spall of um, flame and smoke. And then if you catch it, just you can just see um, the ball to the left-hand side there. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere around there, isn't it? And there's the barrel here. A rather fantastic high-speed shot. But all done using modern gunpowder. And when Peter came along, he's the director of a medieval reconstructed town in Denmark, 
and their remit is to investigate medieval technology. And he gave us the ability to go there each summer for a week or two, put together some experiments. We had a licensed firework maker, the man who made the fireworks for Tivoli Gardens, who used to, he's now retired, they use Chinese fireworks now. Um, so he was legally allowed to do it, and he, he would supervise us and in fact do a lot of the work. But we're able to use this centre in, in Denmark um, to, have a, to do some work. And our initial experiments were, were quite simple. We wanted to just get some, we wanted to make and test gunpowder using as far as possible medieval methods. What that meant was, what we were interested in specifically in the very early time is what was the effect of the composition, going back to those that bit I showed you earlier, and what was the effect of corning? Um, I'll come on to corning, I'll tell you what corning is a bit later, but it's making, it's making the gunpowder into little pellets. And it's always said that making it, corning gunpowder made it much, much more powerful. We'll come back to that. So, we went out to collect our components. So we needed sulphur. Well, there's two places in Europe where sulphur came into Europe in the medieval period. Sicily, the volcanic areas of Mount Etna, where actually the, the sulphur is mined underground. And Iceland, where the sulphur is everywhere. Uh, it just covers the centre part of the island. And we know from records that sulphur came into northern Europe um, because I was in Denmark, they're close links with Iceland. It made a nice synergy. So we went to Iceland. Of course, we were a medieval centre. We did a lot of work. We collected sulphur in medieval clothing, in medieval dress, brought it back, whatever. And then we had to refine it. We, we found a new way to do this now. But at the time, the early period, what we decided to do is the simplest, easiest way possible. And what we did is we just heated up that material we collected in Iceland in an oil bath. Sulphur melts, I forget exactly, it's 120 degrees centigrade, I think. So it melts quite readily, and then we poured it through a piece of cloth into cake tins. Perhaps that's sulphur. Just a little bit. It's just a nice, easy way of doing it. So it's pretty medieval, if you ask me. I mean, charcoal. We all know what charcoal is. We had a ready supply of alder. There's a lot of work about which was the best wood. We, at this time, we just wanted to get some charcoal. It mattered to us that it was the best or the, so that we also would. We made our own clamp. And this is Peter Vemming here on the right. It's very rare to get a picture of Peter. He's always on the other side of the camera and insists on not being photographed. I mean, very few, but he's, a, he's the guy that's really been the, the driving force a lot behind this. Um, so I must have a lot to owe to, to Peter uh, for doing this work. But out of that, we got charcoal. Okay, they were the simple bits. Saltpeter. As I said before, it's potassium nitrate. Now the problem with this is, it has this stuff in it. Nitrogen. Now, I don't know how much you know about nitrogen, but nitrogen is 80% of the air we breathe, and it makes N2. Two atoms of nitrogen come together. And when they come together, they form an incredibly stable bond that's very, very, very hard to break. It's a very inert substance. What it means is, you can't find potassium nitrate in a mine, in a pile, in a heap. You can't go and mine it, you can't go and collect it. You have to make it. And like almost everything I've said today, there is one exception to that. Proves the rule always. But anyway, you have to make this stuff. But there is, funnily enough, a very easy and relatively easy supply of it. And that comes from all of us and the whole animal kingdom. When you eat food, your body takes the food, turns it into energy and all that. But a waste product is always urea. Now urea is poisonous and that's what your kidneys do. They extract it from your blood, get rid of it in urine. So actually the urine of animals is full of nitrogen compounds. And to make nit potassium nitrate, this is where you need the dung heap. And a dung heap consists of urine, dung, and soil. And we've done a lot of wondering why all those things are needed. And it turns out, you'll see, you do need all three. Funnily enough, all the old recipes talk about adding straw. And we always thought, well, straw, it doesn't really matter. Actually, we think it does matter. It helps our aerate the pile. But anyway, these are the things you really need. And what happens, very briefly, is... Bacteria in, in, the, in the heap, the urease bacteria, turn the urea into ammonia. Further bacteria turn the ammonia, nitrosomonas, into nitrite. That's got two, you see two oxygens. 
and then you need a third bacteria, nitrobacter, and you've got nitrate. So if you make up a pile of dung, urine and soil and, and dung and, and whatever, you can it'll ferment very much like your compost heat at home and those bacteria will act on all of that and produce nitrate. And that's, this is a 16th century picture, that's what they're doing here. This is, this is the extraction plant to get the nitrate out. But here's all the piles. And of course it's fantastic fertiliser, so of course it grows plants all over it. And this needs a year or two to work to get enough. I also put this in very briefly, this came up very briefly, because actually there's very, very little evidence for saltpeter works in this country, for instance. This was found in the record office in Ipswich uh, a few years ago now. It, was, it wasn't to do with the saltpeter, it's to do with a land grant or something, and it was talking about that. But actually, this is the saltpeter works, absolutely enormous saltpeter works here. And here's where the pile of dung heaps are in, inside, underneath these pentis roots. That was quite exciting. It's dated 1590. I forget the exact date, but it's in the 1590s. So we had to make our own dung heap. So here's poor Ruth. There's a scale <laughs> just to show us <laughs> making our dung heap. And we put a small pentis roof over it, and we filled it through full of three or four tons of dung, of soil, and we added urine, which came in uh, old milk churns, as you can see. And we put this together... Um, the, the, the other thing, uh, uh, we had a failed attempt at this uh, earlier, this is another attempt. Uh, you do need piles, you need air, you need to oxygenate it, you need actually, if you can, to keep aerating it, which is where I think the straw came in. It also raises the temperature, like your, much like your compost heap at home, and we were just checking this here to see that actually it does, it was warmer than the air. Uh, you can't probably see it, it's just a slide, but actually there was a yellow, f uh, sorry, a white film forming on the soil, so whereas it should have been very dark brown. So we got very excited, I can tell you, are we forming saltpeter? But how do you get it out? And uh, fortuitously, of course, nitrate is very soluble, so you can get it out with water. And the way you do it, this is a 16th century uh, treatise by a man called um, Erka, you put it into buckets, you fill it full of the saltpeter soil, you pour water onto it, and they always have a little um, piece of wicker to stop the water sort of penetrating so it, splash, it doesn't splash on the surface. It's quite interesting. And you, you let it stand, and after a day or two, you let it run out into here, and then you take that, and you put it into a boiler, you boil it down, evaporate it, and the, the saltpeter crystallise out. That's the simple way. I would need another hour lecture for me really to explain all the ins and outs of that, but that's the simple way. So what did we do? We got together our team in Denmark, uh, dressed in our master gunner's uniform, and our, uh, what we call our churls, our labourers, filled our buckets full of saltpeter earth, filled them with water, drained them off into further buckets, put them into a boiler, with Jens, our wonderful colleague in Denmark, boiled it down, we got very excited because all the uh, accounts talk about this scum forming on top, a very heavy, thick scum. Um, Paul Ruth spent days scumming this off, so it was really looked fantastic. And in the end, we got saltpeter. And it's, what's really, really characteristic of it is these long needle-like crystals. And in fact, um, we, we, we were talking about it some years ago, and in the 17th century, they talked about ickles of saltpeter. How oh, we go, what earth are ickles? And then a colleague came along and said, of course it's obvious, it's icicles. Ic and that's what they do if they form, and you'll see a bit later. They form these long, thin crystals, just like icicles form. But, there's always a but. The sources told us that we'd expect 3 to 5%, so we processed a metric tonne. So we should have got 30 kilos, 50 kilos. We got 150 grams. <laughs> So we're doing it right, we're getting it, but we, we, and we still, uh, uh, I said to someone earlier, we still, this is still work we've got to go on. We know the process, we can do the process. Now we've got to find out what we're doing wrong, why aren't we doing, getting the, the yield we should. Oh, I've got to stay on this one over a moment. Um, so, so we're getting a sort of Now, that left us in a bit of a quandary, because we then wanted to make gunpowder. We've got a sulphur and we've got a charcoal, where are we going to get a saltpeter from? Well, I told you earlier you couldn't go and dig it up. 
well, you can in one place on Earth. It's in Chile, and there's a very strange phenomenon on the on the west coast of Chile, where the environment, the winds, the rain, the sea, and everything have formed deposits, huge deposits of sodium nitrate. And that's been imported into Europe for about 100 years, longer than that, I think. And that's, that's used as fertiliser. And there's a couple of companies, especially one in Spain, that converts the sodium nitrate into potassium nitrate. So it's as near as we could get. So I'm afraid we had to cheat. So we've used what we call chili saltpetre in our work. And the work on getting saltpetre itself ourselves what goes on. So now we need to make a gunpowder. <coughs> this is the way it's done in a 15th century firework book owned by the Royal Armouries in Leeds. Wonderful uh, pestles and mortars, slightly mechanised, that's rather a nice one. Uh, I'm always fascinated by the fact it has this uh, hourglass. They're actually doing it for a time, so it's actually quite you know, a standard process. Um, I also wondered why the man on the left is showing his bottom, but ideas for you. <laughs> there, there. But this is us. <laughs> um, because we were then doing something dangerous, we decided we wouldn't do it in the open with our costume on and everything. So uh, you could just see Lars, who's our the firework maker here. He's sort of directing work. And we're using wooden mortars and pestles uh, to do all the work, because of course you don't want anything. And what we did, really simply mixed up charcoal, sulfur, just ground them up, mixed them up in proportions and ground them together. Didn't actually do it for very long, five, ten minutes. Now, I told you, I said something about corning earlier, uh, and what corning is, is make it into pellets, and the way you do it is you, you wet the mixture you've made, so you make it up first with your proportions. You wet it with alcohol, this is, I forget if this was cherry or apple brandy we used here, um, and whatever, and then you push it through a sieve, and it comes out as pellets the, the size of the sieve and it's a rubbish photograph it, black powder is almost impossible to take a photograph of because it's just black uh, but you get little pellets and this is the idea we wanted to make some, cor some corned powder to, to try it again now what do we use, so we've got a gunpowder we've made some simple gunpowder and it's near a way to gunpowder in medieval ways what do we fire it from, how do we test it well, sorry I forgot to say, uh, and what we were interested in, there are quite a few recipes in 15th century sources and we extracted these a good range and they're just given these from the titles of the manuscripts we got them and you see they range from 50% saltpeter to the, the 75% which is thought to be the best what we decided we wanted to fire it and the way we would do it is fire it from a gun and then measure the velocity of the ball it sent out and that would give us a measure of the power of the gunpowder this is a famous gun found in Stockholm in the 19th century. It's called the Lohsholt or Lohsholt gun. Um, and it's always said, it's not dated, but it's always said to be an early piece because of its similarity to the millimetre and millimetre piece in the bottom photograph. But we were able to acquire um, a modern replica of this, which we could actually put gunpowder in and fire. So that's what we did. I, sorry, it's a rubbish photograph, but there's the little gun in there. It's a little tiny thing. It's only about 30 centimetres long, just over a foot something like that. It's in a, a wooden um, bed. Uh, this is the, the device that measures the velocity. And we managed at this time to hook up the Danish army. They brought along their wonderful radar, which gives us trajectories and ranges. And this was the little setup. This is on the beach in Jutland, in Denmark, which is the official Danish army testing ground. So we're completely uh, about 200 yards to one side, they're sunbathing. <laughs> but this is the Danish army for you. So we, we, we went through our tests, we had measured amounts of gunpowder, very carefully measured out. It's a very strict loading procedure, we did it all, whatever, and we fired it. And to be, say that we were dumbstruck when we did this test, this really was. We expected this one, the 50%, we were expecting the ball might just have dropped out the end, might have just flown off or something. It's 110 metres a second. That'll kill you. OK, it's not as good as that 75%, but it worked. So where's your theory that low nitrate powders don't explode? What have we done? How do you, how do you explain it? Now, it's a funny thing about experimental archaeology. It's often the failures which tell you more than the successes. So we went back and had a look at what we did. And this is what we did. The gun had been made 
with a bore of so many millimetres, and then someone else had made the ammunition for it. And the ammunition was about a half a millimetre too big. So each time the ball had had to be hammered into the bore. And the powder was acting, it was like a, a champagne cork. What was happening was it was so contained inside the barrel that all the powder was burning, even with the low nitrate. All the gases and smoke was being formed. And it got to a certain pressure and went pop. So actually, you can make a gun with low nitrate powder. And then you think, well, did they do that? So then you find a wonderful tapestry that's now in Genoa, and look at the guy here. See his hammer? See the tompion at the end here? That's what he's doing. He's actually forcing the gunpowder in. Now, let me just summarise the results of this, because I just want to, we did quite a lot of testing, and I want to go on some other things, but the, the results of this first initial one, and we've done this several times now, is, yeah, it works. It works quite well. It's not up to modern standards, of course, but it works. We tried corning. Uh, there's a lot of factors to do with explosions and gunpowder and things. And it, it, for our experiments, it made no difference at all. Now, actually, I think there may be a reason for that, which is, again, a bit complicated. But funnily enough, it doesn't always make a difference. What it did do, though, is we had, when we used corned powder, we had absolutely no misfires. Whereas with the powdered gunpowder, it occasionally just fizzled and wouldn't explode. That's quite interesting where you don't get any misfires. What it seemed to say is the composition is not as important as it's been thought. And this is the real crunchy, the really important part. It's not the composition which is crucial. It's, it's what I call degree of compaction. I haven't got a term for it. And it's quite interesting. I could take 60% 40, 10 nitrate powder, okay, make that up, put it on the table here and set light to it and fill this entire room with smoke and it wouldn't explode. Take exactly the same powder, put it in a gun barrel, artillery or handgun, put a ball in front of it, and I could shoot any of you. Third thing, the exactly the same gunpowder, not low nitrate powder, I can turn the same powder into a rocket, which will the gunpowder that burn for four, five, six seconds. So you can see composition may be important, but this the way the gunpowder in its physical state is utterly crucial. And what I want to go on is show you some of the work now that we've sort of done around this and why that's important and what's happening and what we've been doing. I just went on to say, of course, I've just said that, this is a picture. This is, Needham was saying that the Chinese didn't get a gun because they could make rockets very early. What I'll show you is rockets are not easy to make. And I think, unlike Needham, that this is a gun, whereas he thought it was some sort of eruptor that didn't really a gun. Uh, and here's another picture of, uh, and actually the Chinese probably invented guns in the 12th or 13th century. Now I want to go on now, and I, I, it got a bit boring me talking, I sort of see some rather nice pictures now. We were, got very, very, very interested because although gunpowder weapons, the guns and the artillery and the small arms weren't being used in the medieval period, incendiaries were incredibly part of warfare. And they're not really regarded. Most people don't see them. They've disappeared. They've been blown up, destroyed. They're not mentioned very much in sources. But actually, there's a huge number of incendiaries in the early, early in the medieval and early modern world. And the first one, uh, the fire lance, which is sometimes called a tronk or whatever, is different names in different uh, languages, is a, is a device often fixed to the front of a lance, and it's spewed forth fire. Uh, out the front, and it was fantastic to frighten horses, good to use against men in narrow places and whatever. And there are early 16th century recipes for how you make them up. So, again, another picture made of a tube filled with gunpowder mixtures of various types. So why don't we try it? And here's Lars uh, making up our trunk, uh, quite complex mixture of powders that burn at different rates, some of which are compressed and some of which are not. So some burn quick and some burn fast, which is quite interesting. Here we are, we just lashed it to the front of a lance, a piece of dowel, a piece of wood, and my gosh, did it work brilliantly. Burned for about 10 to 12 seconds, spewing forth flames and smokes, a fantastic weapon to use against, you know, uh, uh, enemy coming towards you. And the wonderful trebuchets in the, in the distance of what are actually the medieval centre. Uh, the, the trebuchet on the right is fired every day in the summer. It is the most amazing sight. 
If you ever can go and see that being fired at night when they fire a flaming ball, is something else. Now, interesting, another thing that sort of a lot in the literature, a lot around, what we call very simply fire pots. Ceramic pots filled with some sort of incendiary mixture and the recipes are there, covered up, a fuse, and then you throw them by hand or in a sling. And it's another weapon that actually was much more common in the medieval period than we all think. Slings were used extensively uh, right through into the 15th and I think even into the 16th century. But you can see it putting it into a sling to be thrown. Well, we had the recipes. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. And these do survive. There are, there's a fantastic collection of firework weapons in uh, southern Germany at Coburg Castle. Uh, here's the pots. They're empty, of course, completely empty. Now, I must explain about this. This is the fuses. And again, this is explained in the sources. This is rope. You make up a very concentrated solution of saltpetre. You put the rope in it. You leave it so it soaks in. You take it out and dry it. And when you light the rope, it stays burning. It's how they keep cigarette papers, or they used to keep cigarette papers alight so they don't go out. They just burn all the time. You buy a cigarette and you just light one in, it just burns the whole way around. It's because something in the paper is making it burn. So what you can do, you see, is you can light the ends of these quite safe, get it in your sling or hand, throw it, and the idea is when it hits, it should go off. It sounded very improbable to us, because the actual mixtures that go in it are made up principally of gunpowder and animal fat. And that's what this is, this goop, gloopy mess inside here. We use lard, ordinary um, butcher's lard, mixed up the gunpowder to the recipe given to us, um, looked totally silly. I mean, we just thought this isn't going to work. And we made up, we had to do it safely of course, so this is how we rigged it up. So we could drop it from a height so it would smash. And we had a trigger mechanism. Um, and hopefully this will work. Um, so there's the fuse being lit so it's safe. There's the ends just taking it up. I think this is one of the very, we did about uh, half a dozen I think tests in the end. I think this is one of the very first ones because they don't give you enough <laughs> to raise it up high. And we've just, on the ground, we've just put some uh, wooden boards and a few stones um, just to make sure it has hit something so it wouldn't shatter on the, on the grass. Ah! Oh no! Come on! Oh, it's not working, it's, it's going slow. Sorry, the, the video's sort of jumping. But it worked brilliantly. I, we just could not believe just this mixture and just these tiny bits of um, fuse setting it off. Fantastic device. And interestingly, there was a small piece of film on YouTube about this and um, archaeologists working at Corfe Castle down in uh, Dorset, is it, discovered this and were a bit perplexed because it has three handles. It's a fire pot. So they were able to sort of tell them actually they found a fire. Now we were always wanting to experiment with arrows because you've all seen the Hollywood films, you dip the arrow, you know, it's the flaming cloth, you dip it into petrol or whatever, set light to it and fire it. But when you read the sources, that is not how it works. The gunpowder fire arrows are much, much more complex than that. Um, and here again from the firework book is the making fire arrows. The arrow has a small fabric bag attached to the front. Uh, it's full of a gunpowder mixture. Um, and that's how they whatever and I just want to point out to you just to look at the bottom here just see these two guys dipping things in here because this puzzled us for a bit and I'll, we'll come back and you'll see something about that and they were quite extensively used often from crossbows but also from bows and they were fantastic for sticking in thatch and buildings don't forget in a pre-modern age everything's made of wood uh, everything's thatch straw it's all in uh, flammable so you're firing these. If you can also see, oh, I think I did put a, sorry, I put a detail. You can see that this is something else we found. They actually have to have a tiny fuse on them. I'll come back to that and you'll see. Because again, this, I'm, I'm summarizing a sort of several days work here. We started off without a fuse and realized it didn't work. And then we went back to this, saw the fuse, thought, tried it. Ah, oh, that's how it works. So this was a fire arrow from another 15th century firework book, uh, one in Copenhagen. Uh, and that's our replica of it, the bag of incendiary mixed, tied up with string. And then the source tells you, it's not a picture of it, but the source then tells you, you dip it or you coat it in pitch. And you heat the pitch up and you coat to make a hard coating. And I think that's what those guys were doing 
uh, in the first picture they were giving that. You've now got this wonderful uh, incendiary packet to go. We managed to be, Pisa had an old crossbow, a modern crossbow uh, made up. Here he is. So we discovered you had to cut the little bag at the front, insert a little bit of quick match in, light the quick match, and we just, this is the result of quite a lot of test firings. You then, you then had to wait a bit, because we often put a, quite a bit of match on it just to be safe, but we wanted it to burn down before we fired. But, um, there you go. Yeah, well, the films aren't going as well as expected. They're a bit jerky, unfortunately. But it sticks in, uh, as you can see. And then the fuse burns down. So you're not interested in it burning all the way, because actually, if you do... Sorry, and then basically it goes, and the little packet, the little pitch packet, what it does, because it opens at the front, it shoots flame forward at your, tar oops, at your target. So it's a fantastic way of setting light to, to stuff. And what we discover is if you do light a, an arrow and did it in any way, you sort of think you can fire it, by the time it gets to the, where it's going, the target, it's gone out. So, you know, this was a much better way of doing it. Gosh, I've got to run my time, I have to speed up. Now, I wanted very, very, very much to say something about rockets because rockets are rocket science and they do are quite complex devices. What you need to make a rocket, you need a thick, rigid outer tube, you need very highly compacted powder, very highly compacted powder, and you need a void up the centre. Okay? And what happens is when you put the fuse up the centre, you set light to it, the, the gunpowder burns from the, this surface outwards, generating huge amounts of smoke and gases, which shoot out the back and give you a propulsion. And you improve it all by what's called choking the end of your tube, squeezing it, and the rocket makers call it choking with a piece of string. So you're concentrating it and doing it. Put that on. So here we are. This is the sort of tools, and in fact, funnily enough, when you start going around collections in Europe, you see these around. This is what you make rockets on. That needle that steel ch that forms the void this this is you then put that over the top you put a wooden cover over the top in which your cylinder your paper cylinder that holds your rocket sits so it controls it and then what you do is you put little bits of gunpowder in you put a tamper on over the top and you knock it with a mallet and what's quite interesting is the tampers all have holes up the center of course because they have to fit over the needle and what you do is you, you put in a couple of spoonfuls of powder, put a tamper in, tap, 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 hard, put an ore in, tap, tap, tap. So you make a solid, very hard um, gunpowder. And that will burn, sorry, that, that's a, a 17th century uh, picture that you can see, that's what you've got. You've got the void up the center, you've got it going. You put a stick on it, you light it, and that's why I called it from the dunghill to the stars, because you from going. But do you see, the, the point I wanted to make very strongly is rockets are not simple. You can't just take a bit of rocket, a bit of gunpowder, light it, and expect it to go off like that. It's actually quite difficult to make. Now I wanted to just end on a, a five minutes of the sort of very latest, newest work we've done, because we were interested in this idea. Everyone talked about how the West dominates the world. And I want to put forward an idea that basically one of the reasons why Europe was able to dominate the world for such a long time is because saltpeter from India. If you go back in sources and look at it, from the, certainly from the early 16th and certainly, sorry, from the early 17th and from the 1650s especially, saltpeter is being imported into this country from, from India in increasing, increasing, increasing amounts. So this is right through the 18th century. And if you ch ch chart this through the 19th century, by 1850, it's, I forget the figure, but it's something like uh, 25,000 tonnes. So you're really getting it. But where was it coming from? We have two very enigmatic pictures from the back of Joseph Needham's book. This, we think, is the, the equivalent of the barrel extracting the nitrate. That's the barrel, goes through the bottom and it's collected there. And this is the boiling pit, you know, you're boiling it down. So we, we raised some money and very, very speculatively went to India and through a friend of a friend who knew someone who knew someone else who would then introduce us to someone, as it were. We ended up at a tiny place called Jay Laser. Uh, this is Agra, 
the, the Taj Mahal, so we're just to the south of Delhi, and this is Jay Laser. And what we found was a whole uh, saltpeter making factory. Here is the extraction, this is a square one, and we got them to get, excavate it for us and look at it. Here's how you extract your nitrate. They used a piece of jute sacking. We just asked them to do it exactly as they would do it uh, on top. They then put their saltpeter earth on top, put water over it, and you can see he's breaking the fall of the water with the sacking like they did earlier. Collecting the water. Here's the picture. This is what we found. There is that. There's the boiler there, and there it's there in there. You can see it. It's quite very, very hard to photograph. And the fire is put underneath. And we were speculating. We were wondering, how on earth, if you make this, you need enormous amounts of energy. Where's all the wood, the material coming from? So you turn up in India, and you're driving across the country, and the answer is plain as the nose on the India face. They collect cow dung as fuel by the hundreds of thousands of tons. And that's what they use. It's fantastic. You can go as much as you like. Now this was utterly fascinating and it, it, it turned us around. We thought this was them taking the saltpeter out of solution and, and dumping it here. And it's not. This is the impurities. What you do is you slowly increase the concentration of nitrate here and as you do that the impurities fall to the bottom and are scooped out. And what you then do when it comes to a certain point is you take out the liquid and they scoop it out into a settling tank. You let it settle and you get saltpeter. And they will make saltpeter enormous amounts of it. And this is the saltpeter just ground up for drying. But that's actually saltpeter icicles as they come out of the sedimentation tanks first when they come before they're ground up. So there were our Ickles. And of course, all this work needs a huge number of people of, of, of people to help us do it. Primarily, Peter and, and the, the, the Danish Middle Age, the Lava Centre, of course, but lots and lots of people are too numerous to mention have helped produce the videos and the work of that. And I hope that's just given you a, just a small taste of something which looks, on the face of it, to be so simple, just a mixture of three simple ingredients, can be actually incredibly complex. Thank you very much.